Thank you very much, Lana, for your help and your support. Also, I want to thank the uh, Center of Hellenic Studies for inviting me here. And also, I want to thank you all of you. You are here tonight with me. I feel honored. It's something which is over my dreams. So, as you heard, I'm not an archaeologist. I am a Greek a contemporary jewelry, make, jewelry and object maker. The title of my presentation is uh, Crossing Paths with a Prehistoric Craftsman. This is a dream. It is a game of imagination. It's a journey. And I'll try to take you with me in this journey. Over the last 15 years, I've had the opportunity to work and share unforgettable moments with a group of archaeologists, scientists, and conservators. Through this experience, I gained valuable knowledge, which I couldn't have as a classically trained goldsmith. It's true. I have learned so many things which I couldn't have as a goldsmith. Our collaborative project investigates Mycenaean goldsmithing, but we also want to learn as much as possible for the prehistoric craftsman. My task is to focus on tool marks, tools, techniques, gestures, orientation of movements, and rhythm of making. For example, here, we have a fragment from a hilt. A hilt is a handle of a sword, as you see here on the left. It is from Mycenaean Cemetery of Diras of Argos of 15th century BC. And if we can go close, we can see here the tool marks, the tool marks from the sisal that Mycenaean craftsman used. He marks the circles, and then by going back and forth, back and forth he makes the circles. It's not made on a mold, it's freehand. Also, we can see that he doesn't have any rhythm in the space here, but if, you go, if we go closer with the electronic microscope, we can see the identity of the tool. These marks make uh, show us the identity. Also, we can see the direction of the movement because for us, another interesting thing is to learn to understand how he moves his, his body or how he moves his hands, the gesture. And then I try with, uh, I explain with drawings how the objects were made and the procedure of reconstructing the movements and practices of the Mycenaean craftsman. On the left, you can see all the details is needed to explain so we can reconstruct this object. This is later in the video. And on the right is, uh, when we join two pieces of uh, gold Mycenaean vessel from making the rivets by guessing. This is a guessing, is that what we can prove it? But just to explain, to make the holes and then riveting both pieces. Uh, the surface of an object is like a script. I have to learn its vocabulary so I can understand how the ancient technician worked. Also, failures and errors are very helpful. Here I show you two details to understand what I am talking about. This uh, on the left, there is a detail from a gold cap from Ikin and South, Gra uh, South Grace known as uh, Nestor's cap for the 16th century BC. And if we go closer, we can see the size of the hammer blows. They are so close, this means that it's a very good craftsmanship that he has a stability when he is working. And uh, he was, uh, yeah, we can see the difference here. He uses a different uh, hammer with cross pin head. And uh, there he is nervous because it's a, it's a difficult part because he, he must be very careful maybe and to protect it from breaking. On the left, on the right, we have another information that this uh, handle, a uh, dog uh, handle is made out of with the lost wax casting. And we have this information because of the traces of the wax here. Also, we have see here some uh, details that tells us that of, about the temperature of the casting. So I have faced many difficulties during this uh, uh, research project, but the most difficult period is uh, was when I realized that uh, in order to understand him better and come closer to him, I had to forget what I have learned as a classical goldsmith. 
I had to learn from uh, what he had made. I had to learn from zero. And uh, I had to learn from an object, as Ben Liniel says. He's a good friend of mine and we uh, talk about this. Uh, these research projects uh, have immensely uh, impressed me, but it's not right. I can say that it's something more than that, which I can't explain it so easy here. So my work and me are it constantly in the influence my work. Therefore, I will describe briefly some of these projects so that I can help you better understand my work. On 2014, the organizers of the exhibition, the Greeks, uh, which, which was shown in the United States and Canada, asked us as a team to choose an object, uh, Mycenaean object or jewel, to make a replica, to reconstruct it and put it side by side with the original one to show the tools we used and also a video. We have chosen this uh, Mycenaean gold roboid accessory from a soft grade four of the 16th century BC from Mykene. And the dimensions are seven centimeters 0.6 wide and four centimeters 0.7 wide uh, heights. A detail: uh, when I was visiting museum, most of the time I was uh, uh, curious about these objects, how they are made. So I had the luck. Sometimes life <laughs> gave me the luck to study it and reconstruct it. This was very important time for me. On the left, you can see that these uh, rhomboid objects have a core. They have a core, engraved core from ivory, bone, antler. We're not sure yet. And then it's, they are covered with a thin uh, gold leaf. But in order to understand better, I'll ask Lana to show you a small video so you can understand it better. So the, here I had to make uh, uh, saw blades from uh, bronze because all the tools are made out of bronze. I hammered it to make it very strong. It was a cattle uh, bone. Uh, it's a very short video. Uh, here are the details from a uh, microscope, so you can see, uh, the then I explain you about all this, about the tool and the movement and how I learned to do it. I use charcoal so I can see what I am engraving, see the details. All this, uh, we didn't found any tools, so all these tools you had to guess and make them work. Also, this one is a difficult tool to find out how it makes straight lines. Charcoal helped me to see in every step, in every stage, the, what I am engraving. Then I use the thin uh, gold leaf. The original one has a thickness of 0 0.35, but I use a thicker because I was not sure that we, uh, I can make it. So I wanted to have, uh, we made here the same mistakes when I saw them under the microscope. So it's, this is this time, it was very, very interesting because the first time I was working with gold, all the other times I'm working with silver. And uh, when I saw the, uh, the, the motive to appear, I was moved. I asked the cameraman to stop because I was feeling that I was doing the same thing that he was doing 3,000 years, 3,005 years earlier. I was feeling like was side by side with him. And uh, this is it. it. It's not the same with the original one. I, we made some changes.
uh, here. The, the more difficult part of this, uh, more I faced two difficulties. One, to understand the, the pattern, how it was made. I was calling to Nikos to find a mathematician to if we have any uh, advice. And then the other difficulty was, uh, what was the tool? After a long uh, ex examination under the microscope, well, I saw that the sides of the grooves were vertical like this and not like this. So I guess that the tool was something which had two edges, two very sharp edges. Uh, after a lot of work, I found we found that the, this tool has similar, made similar grooves like the original one. And uh, in a later chapter, I, I'll explain to you how I learned to use it. On the left, you can see some of the materials, uh, the tools we, we used. Uh, this is another field of knowledge. For more than three years, uh, we're studying or trying to learn how the Mycenaeans uh, used the granulation. How was the... Uh, what was the knowledge of these periods? The archaeologists gave me a lot of information, uh, many articles to study, and uh, to have in my mind anything about the era I was studying for. And uh, we worked on uh, gold pieces from uh, excavation from the Mycenaean cemetery of Diras of Argos of the 15th century BC. And I had to learn uh, how to make my oil lamp, my blow pipe, how to make with these the granules, and uh, then how to solder them. The size of this uh, conical bead, which I have chosen to study, is uh, two centimeters 0.7 wide and one centimeter 0.7 height. The size of the granules is 0 0.6 to 0 0.8, and the thickness of the metal is less than 0, 0 0.2 of a millimeter. This is very fragile and very light in weight. Maybe it was influenced from uh, seashells like this you see on the left. But also to understand all the procedure of the experiments we do, I show you a small video. Uh, because we didn't have time to show you, or didn't show you how we form this uh, conical uh, uh, bead. It's, uh, it needs a lot of time to explain to you. Here I cut the pieces of gold so I can make the granules out of it. And this is important. How with the blowpipe someone can make granules? It's magic. I couldn't believe before that like, I, I could do it. I could use uh, my breath to control the flame and uh, make granules. These are uh, pictures from a microscope. This one here, this is so nice picture. Make all these sauce first. Then I had to make all these uh, granules. Then I prepared the uh, 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 copper salts which they're used instead of using a, a solder. And slowly, slowly, all the tools we use here are made out of bronze, bronze and a feather. So it, uh, I had to make many practices before the video to learn the movements and how to control everything. And now I'm studying, starting the soldering procedure. This is my new, oil lamp, which I needed more energy, more power than the as I had before. And this is the most beautiful time that you see that gold becomes so red and bright. But I had to control the flame because it was very easy to melt it, like the ancient craftsman did. Uh, the temperature of the flame is about 450 and I raised up to 800 degrees and more uh to join the granules together we had almost same mistake some of the granules uh, fall off so
So error as a cognitive tool. I uh, we understand many things about him uh, because of his uh, errors and, and uh, how he corrected them. So because he raised the temperature more than I did before, <laughs> he melted one granule here and also other four were ready to melt. That uh, for us, it's uh, interesting to know it because then we saw that he made some holes. Another information we have that he used a lot of uh, uh, copper salts in order to keep the granules on the sides of the conical bead. This was very important for him. But because he overheated the object, he made some holes like here, and he wanted to correct them. So with a thin uh, gold sheet, he tried to solder it, but this time he soldered with, with a hard solder. And because he was afraid to melt it again, he didn't raise the temperature. So we can see here the unmelted uh, solder. And here is uh, uh, something which uh, it's difficult to believe that someone can do. It's an uh, extraordinary Mycenaean technique. Uh, it was named uh, Chrysokendisi from uh, Professor Chundas, who first examined it by the end of 19th century. And he understood the technique without having the knowledge we have here in the technology. Uh, the Mycenaean craftsmen use this technique to decorate the hilts, the handles of the swords, or the pommels, like this one. The pommel is the top of the handle. And uh, he used these uh, nails, he, which you see here. These nails are not made from wire as we have now, because the wire, this period was made from twisted striped uh, uh, gold uh, pieces and then rolled. I saw it, you'll see it in the next video. The thickness of this part here is 0 0.3 of a millimeter. And the length is between 1.7 millimeter to 2.6 millimeters. Some of them are have the size of uh, insects. It's difficult to see them. So by adding thousands of these uh, nails side by side like brick, like bricks, they fill all this space, and then they flatten it with a burnisher, and then they grave on it. So no one could understand how it was made. So here we have a pommel, and here we have a sword and the pommel of the sword from the Mycenaean cemetery of Diras. But now it is in the Museum of Denmark in Copenhagen. In order to understand better this technique, because it's difficult to describe it, we'll show you a small video. Uh, one of the most difficult uh, to learn is how they could cut the thin gold uh, stripes. It was difficult, it was difficult to make uh, the tool. I had to make a special tool of a special alloy of bronze. There is a big conversation about this uh, cutting tool. They had to twist it. It's, it's uh, the picture is out from a microscope. So the different uh, stages, then I have to roll it with a wooden uh, piece on a marble, but now I have developed the technique. <laughs> uh, so the top piece is what was rolled, and the other was uh, also here I had to make a special tool to cut it. Because sometimes it's you have to use lenses to control this piece. They are very, very small. See the sizes. And this is very big. Then I bend them. Also, this is a special made uh, tweezer, so I can hold and control it. And I learned that to make the tools because I need to find how uh, to find a way to use it. This is the important thing with this. Then I made the mixture of uh, animal glue and uh, pumice powder. I let it dry for about four hours. I made holes also with a special made uh, tool with hardened edge. Uh, all the technique is based on the holes. I needed two years to understand it, that I have to make 
to find a way to make better holes closer to one another. Also, this is with a microscope. To understand, it is so, so small, it's hard, you can hardly see it. Also under a microscope. And then believe me, we have a long way to go to make it something similar to him. I am working more than three years. I practice and now half of it with a burnisher, I'll try to flatten it. And the result means that I need a lot of work to do, to make something similar with him. And through here, I'm working more than two years by experimenting. This is one of the last experiments. And then I try to engrave. First, I mark it. And also, here is a different. He has a, a perfect tool to make his engraving. It's, uh, we are far away from his uh, results. But it's not only the Mycenaean period. Also, in the Museum Benaki, the last three years, parallel with Shokendisi, we are studying with uh, archaeologist uh, Rini Papagiorgiou uh, gold, uh, goldsmithing technique, techniques of the Hellenistic period. We are focused on this uh, diadem here from the third century BC and from the treasure of Thessaly. My work, which was not so easy, when they, told, they asked me that, uh, can you make it? I said, I don't know if I can. I, I couldn't believe that I could do it, but uh, step by step, we make it. I tried to understand how this chain was here, was made to make a part of it. And then I try, I am experimenting to learn how this was made. With this uh, experiments, we, we want to gain the, all the knowledge we can about the workshops, the craftsmen, everything about this period. We have learned a lot, but we'll show you to, if this project is for the exhibition, which will take place in 2023 in Benaki Museum, focused on gold, uh, uh, goldsmithing techniques of the Hellenistic period, gold jewelry. And here I show you some of the stages. Here I have uh, soldered all these pieces. This uh, is uh, uh, granulated uh, wires. And now I'm preparing to solder these two pieces with copper salts. And on the right, you see during the soldering procedure. It's a magic uh, image when you see it so red and bright. Here are some of our publications. And here, uh, the archaeological uh, part uh, ends. And now, so we have also a bell from the church. And uh, uh, what I have learned uh, from this uh, research projects, first, I will start with the tools. I understood the importance of the tool the importance to make the tool you need so you can create the, your idea, you can uh, make what you want. This is uh, something which before I could understand because now you go and buy the tool and do your work. Uh, in general, tools are not shown in the public or the museum exhibitions. They are behind the scenes. They, however, are the ones that support the craftsman during his lonely creative journeys, which is very important because when I spend hours in here, the tools accompany me. I see them and I feel very well because oh, we have a contact with them. On the left, you see bone or ivory tools from para palatial workshops of Mikine or 14th, 13th century. These are in National Archaeological Museum. And on the right, these are the tools which I make, I have made for the purposes of these research projects, but also I use them for myself, for my personal work. Something which I want to tell you here is that uh, through these experiments, I understood that the more friendly material to work with thin gold seeds was bone. No metals, no wood. Bone was the perfect material. 
And it is the information which I gained it only through these experiments. Uh, this is uh, for me the most important part of knowledge. This tool, an extension of the hands. Uh, when I start the research, I spend many hours under the microscopes with lenses, I, with the light of different qualities of life to understand and uh, focus on the tool marks. Because from the only way to see the shape, to understand this, or to guess the shape of the tool are the tool marks. We haven't found any tools. So from the tool mark, I have to guess the shape of the tool. Then after many experimentation, or under the microscope, we see if there are similarities with the tool which I have guessed that works. When we find similarities, then I make the tool. And something which I learned is that I have to let my body let, learn the movement, learn the gesture. And slowly, slowly, I develop the gesture, I de develop the movement, and by developing the movement, I develop the tool. This means that sometimes I have to change it three or four times. And when the movement becomes smooth and flexible, then the tool becomes an extension of my hand. This is important because sometimes you feel so happy that it works and it's, it comes from inside of you. And you. It's difficult to describe it. So here I have some picture. This is a very sharp detail uh, uh, tool which I used uh, for a rhomboid uh, accessory to connect, to connect the circles. Here, this is a tool which is very simple. I had a difficulty with the known tools to make a straight line. But when I, may, when I made three teeth on the front of this tool, it goes straight like a train. It was so easy for me, but I needed some days to understand it. And on the right is a tool which I use for my personal work. I use stone hammers, stone head hammers, to give textures on the surface of the materials. Hammering is not only a technique for me, but also a way of expression. I feel the moment through the hammer blows, the sounds and vibrations into my hands. Here you see, I, I use my personal uh, hammer, which I show you later. The anvil is wooden. Because I prefer to start the forming with the wood and the wood is an old uh, piece of uh, cedar. Cedar is uh, very, it's flexible, but also it's very hardwood. On the left, you see my personal hammer. I made it from a, a special hard alloy. And the handle is made out of wild oak and fits perfect in my hand. So when the important thing with a tool is uh, when you work with it is to feel happy and easy, to, not to harm your body. This is the important part of the tool. So when you make it, you have this in, my, in your mind. Except uh, this, there's another chapter about uh, teaching. I don't like the title of a teacher. I prefer to share, I like sharing. And I share, I am interested, very much interested to share with the students my experience and uh, the knowledge I have gained from these uh, workshops. Uh, also how I learned through observation and repetition and finding uh, new methods of uh, teaching and sharing with students. Uh, another project is to share with them or to explain how they make their own tools. And they start by making their own wooden hammers from uh, wild uh, wood, which I dry it for more than a year so it can be hard. Uh, they, they, make their, they explain why they make it, why it's a personal tool for them. Then by using anticlastic technique, which they learn it parallel with the tool. Uh, they make their own uh, bracelets, as you see on the left, by raising it from a flat sheet of copper. Error and observation are the basic tools in this journey. Also something which I learned from all this uh, experience I had with archeologists. 
And another magical uh, journey is this, is uh, uh, to understand what is, the, what is the power of the flame? What is the energy? How can we use the flame to use it as a tool? They make their own oil lamps, their own blow pipes, and they start playing. By playing, they then make their own granules, like you saw before. And by using, they make their copper salts, and slowly, slowly, they, may, they join them together and understand uh, the granulation technique. And this is magic for them because they could never uh, believe that they are the tools. Because in this technique, you are the tool. You blow the flame. You, you learn how to control it and how to find the heart of the flame, the more energetic part of the flame. But except this, also our team organizes workshops based on ancient technology for archaeologists, university students, and museum visitors, so we can share with them our research project's experience. On the left, you can it's from University of Vern. We went to Nikosopa Dimitriou to show to present them uh, our research projects, and then we made a workshop for archaeologists, researchers, and archaeometers. And on the right, there is uh, in, from Benaki Museum of Athens, celebration of crafts, where many craftsmen from different uh, crafts were showing to people how things were made. Here I'm showing them how to raise uh, from a flat sheet of copper to make a bowl and let the children play with them to put them in water and make them like boats. And here is about my personal work, how my personal work is influenced from all this experience and all this knowledge. Uh, I choose this uh, bracelet because it is uh, a turning point of my work. I made uh, an, a solo exhibition in the Museum Benaki in 2013. I wanted to mark this closing, uh, closing a circle. And I was uh, studying for this exhibition. I had two projects. The one project is to study natural structures uh the, the energies which act inside and outside of the form so they, they give the final form and also i was studying ceramic uh, containers ceramic pottery primitive uh, from the sesclo or from athens which i believe that also they were influenced from uh, the nature as a form so i made this bracelet the lower part is made out of uh, hammer silver wires and copper, and the top part is uh, made out of an old piece, of an old cedar piece, and something which also now, I have the memory of the smell when I was cutting. It was a uh, wooden piece for older than one here, one ye 100 years old from an old house, but the smell was so beautiful and and I needed more than one month to curve this object in order not to crack it. Uh, on uh, some of the jewelry we are studying the archae with archaeologists is stitched on clothes. So I had an idea with uh, textile artist Georgia Gremuti uh, to make a series of uh, jewelry for an exhibition in uh, Barcelona. Hoya Barcelona, uh, to make a series of objects where we combine both works. Uh, Georgia was making the fiber work with uh, textile with silk, which they, she stitched them together with uh, the gold thread. And I made the metal part of silver where I gave, uh, made on the, on the surface uh, uh, several qualities of uh, textures. And also I added a small, a small piece of thin, very thin gold leaf, not to raise the value, but this connects me with the experience and the knowledge I gained from uh, research projects. It's a connection, it's a link. Uh, the colors inf are influenced from Mycenaean frescoes. Uh, before every project, we are. I am working a lot by writing, sketching, playing with materials, and painting. So you see it on the left. Uh, 
for the when I make a jewel or an object, I like their proportions to be related to the human body and functionality. This means that uh, they have to be friendly to me, friendly to my hands, friendly to someone who will hold it. I made this uh, container or vessel, I don't know how you go, I call it in Ahoy for uh, serving wine. I made it from a, from a flat sheet of uh, silver of a thickness uh, one millimeter. I raised it on a wooden anvil with wooden hammers. And only the last stage, I planished it with a steel hammer on a steel uh, anvil. Uh, the nest, the base uh, material here, oh, I'm sorry, is uh, made out of uh, olive wood uh, from an olive wood tree. And the skeleton is made out of uh, forged titanium. I like this antithesis, these contradictions in my work. It is influenced from this so beautiful ceramic source boats from Attica of the third millennium. Every time I go to visit the archaeological museum, I go to see this uh, pottery collections. They are so beautiful. And uh, on the left bottom is how you hold it and you serve it in your glass or in your mouth, if you want it, straight. Uh, for the exhibit for the my exhibition Benake, I also during this period I was studying uh, granulation, so I made uh, some uh, brooches from hammer silver wire. But the difference is that uh, the granulation I used is without basic metal; it's on the air. A technique which also I learned through my research studies. Uh, I was. Uh, Influence from this uh, curd leaves for also from the cemetery of Diras from Argos. Maybe it's the first uh, anticlastic uh, samples we have in uh, from Aegean. It has a very beautiful uh, granulation, a grad in the, uh, which uh, influenced me very much. So this is a detail of uh, my granulation. I spent uh, many hours, days. Uh, I read a lot, I draw a lot, I write a lot during every uh, research. And many ideas come to my mind. Uh, some of them, I keep them, some of them are lost. Uh, during this uh, research project for the roboid objects, I had the question, why he does it? Does it make, does he make it to give value to something which he thinks that doesn't have any value of the bone. No one knows. But for me, it was interesting because this to transform from a modest material to give value to it, it gave me an idea to make a series of uh, brooches for an exhibition of a, a gallery in Barcelona, Mistral 66. And uh, but I wanted to find uh, uh, materials which you could throw them out, you, you didn't get, give any mention to them. And I, I engraved on them a story, a story with symbols. And then I wanted uh, to cover it, to make a shell around it with uh, fine, very thin sil uh, silver uh, parts. So part of it will be hidden, a part of the story will be hidden, the part of the story will be revealed. And then with a, a bone tool, I let some of the story to appear, but not strongly. So uh, I wanted to play with this, to play when you, you keep a story hidden and when you reveal it. I used the many techniques to make uh, all these textures on the surface of the metal. It looks heavy, but it is very light. Also, the skeleton is uh, uh, made uh, from uh, steel. And now I remember that I think that also I saw it in uh, Martinez Dempf gallery in uh, Germany. And uh, also I want to play because you see that uh, this is uh, very heavy, but when you wear it, it's very light. I want to play with this two identities. The container. 
Uh, the container is symbolic for my work, a link which connects me with the human history and memories. I made a series of objects uh, for a uh, exhibition, uh, Parkour Bijou 2017, the group, group exhibition, also it's a collaborati collaborative work. As I told you, I like, uh, I am fond of uh, ceramic containers from uh, prehistoric period. This is a skiffos from Neolithic Sesclo. And, but also I believe that they had containers made out of leather. So these containers, I made them from leather and tried to change their identity, not to see the leather. This is made out of uh, cedar wood also. And also here is a piece of glass which made from Marion Filang, who is the expert to make these uh, kinds of glass, primitive glasses. It's uh, the skeleton is uh, from steel. This also this contradiction. You, but you think it's very heavy, but it's so light you can wear it on a t-shirt. Uh, two years ago, another team of archaeologists asked me to study this silver seas written from a Mycenae soft grave four uh, from the 16th century BC. I was impressed. I was impressed from uh, its uh, balance from its narration and it's uh, from a distortion of the form. So it stuck in my mind. And uh, one year later, I was invited from Michelangelo Foundation to participate in his platform. And then uh, to participate also in the Homo Faber exhibition of 2021. I made this uh, symbolic uh, a container vessel, I don't know what, uh, how I can describe it. It's made out of uh, fragments of uh, old silverware, which all these pieces, I hammered them again on anvil to change their surface, but to keep the memory of the old craftsman in its, on its surface. Uh, I wanted with this work to combine uh, tradition with modernity, but uh, also to make a contemporary object. Something very important for me is I wanted to keep the balance of the silver written, which I have seen, with the roots, which this is not a handle, this is a root which connect me with this memory. I use uh, this, uh, the roots in my work, which they don't like look like roots, for me, but for me are roots. Connections. My recent project is Crossing Paths. The time I was studying uh, Chrysokendisi, I had uh, some uh, questions in my mind. The first is what happens when someone works with so many, so small uh, dimensions, what's happening to him? And the next more important than this is where the skill meets with the creative imagination and how this can reach unbelievable, unbelievable levels of sensitivity and aesthetics. I didn't want to copy his uh, work because I can't, but I wanted to translate my work, my late work, on my late studies on uh, synthesis and rhythm, this is all the small lines I do here, I wanted to translate it into metal. So I made a series of objects. Uh, I started this, uh, this concept uh, two and a half years ago. I wanted parallel to study in the, in the museum and parallel to work, to see if we have parallel paths, if maybe the, our paths could uh, cross. So, but I wanted to work in a totally different way. I wanted to be free from technical, technical restrictions and let the creative process guide me to new paths. So this means that I had nothing in my mind when I started working. So I made every, every jewel is made out of uh, parts of fragments of very thin silver metals, pure silver thickness, less than 0 0.2 of a millimeter. I forged them, then I, I joined them together. And on the surface, I let myself uh, work without 
I let the work guide me. So some days you see good work, some days you, you don't see good work. Some er, All the error failures are recorded. So for me, this work is like a chronicle. And uh, believe me, this is a journey. If you ask me what I have learned from this uh, project uh, for the very historic craftsman, the answer is that I learned a lot about him, but I learned more for myself because I spent hours on these details. I couldn't feel the time, the time was different. Everything was different. The size of the wires is less than 0 0.4, 0 .4 millimeter thickness. And the length is uh, from two to three millimeters long. And here you can see some days, the structure was like this, very close to one another. And some days were like this, more free and more open. This was happening in all the surface. This is why for me it was, and I didn't feel all the space. I didn't want to feel the space. I wanted to write on the space. This is the difference. So and now it's the dream. When I received uh, the invitation from Harvard uh, about October, at first I didn't believe it. I needed more than a week. I was talking with Nikos, is it true? Or I, I didn't know what to do with this. It was uh, more than what I could dream. And then when I find difficulties in my life, I make journeys in nature and in ancient lands. So I made a four day trip uh to sleep uh, by in the outside close to ancient ruins i walked in old paths i had a lot of time to think and to dream then i came back uh, to my workbench i spent many days uh, practicing uh, uh, experimenting with materials and techniques and uh, i waiting for an idea to come then one day I decided to record the time. I find a way to record the time, but without a basic metal, by joining lines by lines and make spaces and making a transparent metal. Everything is recorded. Also many mistakes because this is experimental part, experimental piece, which I tried to learn it. Many difficulties, technical difficulties, how you do it without having nothing behind it. And there was very useful, the experiments which I have done. All this uh, work is based on the, the knowledge I have from these experiments. I made it for this uh, fellowship because I thought that this fellowship gives me a chance, gives me, uh, pushes me to something which I could never believe before. I could never uh, have as an idea. And for this, I write, I have written uh, with Georgia this uh, words. I'm interested in recording the passage of time into the tiny details, into the layers of erosion and the distortion of the form. My aim is to keep in my work the element of time, to carry in its core a journey, a memory of becoming. The size of uh, the wires also here are less than 0 0.4 of a millimeter, but the length is not more than two. The size of this uh, brooch, if I can say it's brooch, is uh, seven centimeter uh, long to four by uh, four millimeters point, uh, five, And I needed approximately two and a half to three months to finish it, I, but I don't know exactly if it's finished. So before I close my presentation, because it, I see it takes, took till too long, uh, I feel grateful for the opportunity that was given to me to do this. Uh, and also I want to thank uh, my colleagues and friends, uh, the archeologists, Eleni Kostadinidis Sivri, the archeologist from Archeological Museum of Athens. Nikolas Papadimitriou from archaeologist from the uh, University of Heidelberg. Irini Papagiorgiou, archaeologist from the Museum Benaki. Maria Kontaki, conservator of the Archaeological Museum. And the scientists from uh, Dimokhtos uh, Scientific Laboratory, Mr. Yanis Basiakos and uh, Liana Filipaki. 
And also, I want to thank uh, Despina Gerulanu for her support is from the Committee of the uh, Museum Benaki and encouragement on our projects. Uh, Zuzu Mitara from uh, Halkis Art School, who trusted me to make a jewelry department 22 years ago. And uh, Lucia Massey, Director of Alchemia, uh, the uh, contemporary jewelry school in uh, Florence, who gives the chance to share this knowledge with the, her master students. Uh, also, my friend uh, ben, ben Linier, who is a teacher, editor, and curator, and he is a very good uh, conversation partner. We share ideas of new methods of sharing knowledge and learning. Our cameraman, Dimitris Alexandru, for his patience. And of course, uh, my wife, Georgia, and our daughter, Vasiliki. Without their help, I don't know if I could be, could be here. Thank you very much. So closing uh, my presentation, I want to thank uh, museums, Archaeological Museum of Athens, of Navplio, Benaki Museum, and Museum of Copenhagen. And I want to close with uh, uh, two questions, three questions, which I have always in my mind. Is a tool an extension of our body and mind? Are we able to learn from an object? Is it worth reevaluating the meanings of these words, observation, repetition, and error? Thank you very much. <laughs>